This is part three of Consciousness and the Two-Track Mind. Um, we're going to finish off this dis lecture by talking about sleep disorders, hypnosis, and uh, substance use and abuse. So let's start off our conversation talking about sleep disorders. Uh, sleep disorders are very debilitating. They're actually listed in the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic Manual for uh, Mental Disorders. And uh, they are debilitating because they do not allow a person to go through the proper sleep stages. So the first one we're going to talk about today is insomnia. And insomnia is a disorder where people have a chronic recurring problem in falling or staying asleep, which means that very often you might wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and you cannot go back to sleep. Your brain has turned on and you lay there and you lay there and you ruminate about things and you can't relax and that is very debilitating because it doesn't take you through the proper sleep stages, the rest and recovery. Sometimes people can't fall asleep. They lay there at night. It seems like they should be able to go to sleep, but they do not go to sleep. The second sleep disorder is called narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is very debilitating because what happens is people have uncontrolled sleep attacks. They are drowsy all day. All They may not sleep at night, but they have sudden sleep attacks. And how this is so incredibly debilitating is they may go directly into REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And if you recall from our discussion about sleep stages, when you are in REM sleep, your brain stem will paralyze you. You will lose your muscle function. You have this protective paralysis. So if you are driving and you are going into REM sleep at a bad time, it could be absolutely, well, it could be life-threatening. So very often people with narcolepsy are not allowed to drive. They do have medication for it. The next disorder is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is the temporary stopping of breathing during sleep and repeated momentary awakenings. The airflow is not going through the body correctly and so what's happening is they're constantly waking up because they've stopped breathing and they are deprived of their slow wave sleep. And that's that delta wave, which is incredibly important to your rest and recovery. So if you're not uh, sleeping through the cycles in the best way possible, you will suffer with health issues. Lots of people end up going on a sleep machine. My own brother has one of these. Um, and what this does is it directs that air flow through. So hopefully you will get a good restorative night's sleep. But very often they are cumbersome. They're uncomfortable. They're not very sexy. And people stop using them. So it can be a problem in itself. So sleep apnea, uh, it really, really can hurt a person's health. Sleep apnea does. The next disorder is night terrors. And night terrors mostly happens with children. And it's a high arousal. A child has the appearance of being terrified. Unlike nightmares, night terrors will occur between stages three and four during that deep sleep. So very often a uh, child the next day will not have any idea that it happened. Uh, it's 
it's very, very scary for a parent, certainly. Uh, you have to comfort the child and get them back to sleep. And the next day they wake up and their the memories are not remembered. Very often during this same time with the night terrors, children and adults may suffer from sleepwalking or talking. Also the same, people don't recall that the next day when they get up. But people can literally get in, get up, walk downstairs, empty out the refrigerator, could leave the door open, and go back upstairs. The next section we're talking about is hypnosis, hypnotic induction. Um, a lot of people want to know, is hypnosis really an altered state of consciousness? But what happens is the power resides not in the hypnotist, but in the subject's openness to suggestion. They do not have mind control power. They are merely engaging people's ability to focus on certain images or behaviors. Some of us are more open to suggestion than others. Um, highly uh, hypnotizable people are people who are usually... Uh, become absor absorbed in imaginative activities. They have rich fantasy lives, um, and it's called the hypnotic ability, the ability to focus attention totally on a task and to become imaginatively absorbed in it and to entertain fanciful possibilities. And what we can do is we can use hypnosis to uh, to help with changing some behaviors okay uh, mostly behaviors such as losing weight it's a lot more difficult to change behaviors when you're talking about uh, drugs alcohol uh, because those are very chemical, they're organic, they are related to our neurotransmitters, to uh, our brain functioning, and its, uh, its chemistry. So there was a time when people used hypnosis to recall forgotten events, and the consensus has been that it's not possible, and courts actually ban testimony where hypnosis is used. People, they get deep into this whole idea and you could actually have a uh, hypnotist or a therapist, if they're using um, hypnosis, insert ideas into your head like, you know, you were uh, so-and-so uh, abducted you when you were 10 years old and, I mean, it, you can just insert these ideas and so you cannot use it in a court of law. But what we can use hypnosis with is therapy. The therapy aspect of it is to use post-hypnotic suggestions to change behaviors, to carry out uh, changes, to eliminate undesired symptoms and behaviors. Um, so it's, it's very, very helpful. Um, what is more helpful with hypnosis is pain management. Um, suggestions, help, and focus is, in the, is the key. Ten percent of us could do major surgery without anesthesia. We become so deeply hypnotized. Ten percent. But the majority of us really could if we were able to be hypnotized in the first place, we could use something, a light twilight anesthesia, and uh, be hypnotized and be operated on. And that in itself is amazing because, of course, general anesthesia is the most debilitating thing of all. The next section we'll be talking about is addiction. Addiction. There might be some question as to whether uh, hypnosis uniquely alters consciousness, 
but there is little question that some drugs do. So psychoactive drugs are chemicals that change perceptions and moods through their actions at your neural synapses. That's important for you to remember. The urges you feel when you're sober are the ones you act on when intoxicated. So these drugs, and we call them substances now, not drugs so much because people didn't think that uh, uh, alcohol was a drug, and of course it is. So uh, where all this work is occurring is it's doing all of its work at the brain's synapses. They stimulate, inhibit, inhibit, excuse me, or mimic the activities of the brain's own chemical messengers, the neurotransmitters. So let's start off by talking about depressants. Depressants. We've got alcohol, tranquilizers or barbiturates, opiates, and what they're doing is they're relaxing your sympathetic nervous system. You'll remember that your sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight system. They calm your neural activity and slow your body functions. They slow your brain activity and your brain activity that controls judgment and inhibitions. It slows that neural processing so that you think you're invincible. You keep going and you could have blackouts. You can stop memories, suppress REM sleep. You can have nerve cell death. It reduces your self-awareness. And what we've got are opiates and derivatives such as morphine and heroin. And what they're doing is they're depressing your neural functioning. Your pupils will constrict. Your breathing slows. Lethargy sets in. And blissful pleasure replaces pain and anxiety. It's short term for a long term price. Okay? So that short term pleasure or relaxation, you're going to have a much larger price because what happens is you then need more and more of it. You try to withdraw from it and what's going to happen is your brain becomes flooded with artificial opiates and it will stop producing its own endorphins. And that is your natural feeling of well-being, your natural painkiller, and you will possibly overdose because you're not producing your own, so you have to keep putting in a, uh, an opiate, uh, an unnatural one, and eventually you need more and more and more to offset what you're no longer producing, and you could possibly overdose and, of course, a combination of barbiturates and alcohol because barbiturates mimic alcohol depressing the nervous system and that could possibly be fatal. The next category is stimulants. Now stimulants are the number one used substance in the United States. And why is that? Well, caffeine Caffeine is in everything. It's in chocolate, coffee, uh, candy, gum these days, energy drinks. We are putting caffeine in everything. And it is, well, it's crazy because now even children are having caffeine. And, of course, they shouldn't be. So caffeine is the number one stimulant along with nicotine, nicotine in cigarettes. And also in the same category, we have amphetamines, cocaine, ecstasy, and speed. And what do stimulants do? Well, they increase your heart rate, your breathing, 
your pupils dilate, dilate, your appetite is suppressed, your blood sugar increases, and energy and self-confidence rises. So we have so much of that every day. And as Americans, we, uh, we need caffeine because we are expected to work so much. We're always, uh, we're working, we're going to school. There's no time. You used to uh, work from nine to five. Now it's like, you know, seven to eight. It's just, it's crazy. So people are needing that extra little fix. So let's talk about uh, nicotine. Let me tell you about nicotine. 5.4 million of its 1.3 billion customers are dead a year. Nicotine is not only mood altering, it's also reinforcing. It can take somewhere between 7 to 10 seconds for it to release its stimulant effect, epinephrine and norepinephrine, which diminishes your appetite and boosts your alertness. So it's no surprise that people would become addicted to cigarettes. How many of you have watched the movie, the movie, the series Breaking Bad? Talk about a stimulant that has deadly effects on people is methamphetamine and that is uh, absolutely horrible and what it does make sure you read these little uh, inserts that I have here because it absolutely is important that you understand how deadly methamphetamine is if you've ever seen a person who is very thin, who may have cuts on their faces. Uh, it ages you absolutely horrible. Um, it can be uh, taken intravenously. It's smoked uh, crack, that crackling sound, the little crystalline balls. Um, it rots your teeth. It destroys people's lives, um, and it is absolutely deadly. While that methamphetamine is working on your dopamine, which is our pleasure pathway, one of our neurotransmitters, and it's using it all up, it's flooding your body, the same thing is happening with cocaine. Cocaine goes from a fast track from euphoria to crash, so you need more and more of it. The same with ecstasy, the I love you, that social connection, it's releasing stored serotonin blocks, it's reabsorption, thus prolonging the feel-good flood, and it is affecting your body so dramatically, uh, and it affects your sinuses, it affects your brain, um, and it took, takes so much pressure on your heart. Uh, Whitney Houston uh, uh, was a very big cocaine user and in the end when she died she died because her poor heart was worn out because you're you can't be on stimulants to such a degree because it's increasing all of your heart rate your blood pressure and all of this is taking its wear and tear on your body and it will affect you in the long run the last category I'm going to be talking about are hallucinogens and we start off talking about uh, LSD, which is a synthetic drug, which means it was made in a lab by Albert Hoffman in the early 30s. Um, and of course, we think about hallucinogens and LSD as uh, very much part of the 60s, and uh, LSD distorts perceptions, evokes sensory images in absence of sensory input. You have euphoria, you feel a detachment to panic, lots of colors. It really can produce a near-death experience. So a lot of people who take LSD 
have no interest in repeating the experience. If you've ever seen Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, it does a really great job of giving you that effect of what uh, LSD is. There really is no after, uh, like a hangover effect, but it certainly does have an input, imp, an input on your body. So uh, LSD, very, very acid trip is what you might have heard it, of course, before, but it is a synthetic drug. And lastly, there is marijuana. Um, marijuana, of course, is from the hemp plant, and that is a natural uh, product, although I have to tell you, you have to be very, very careful because there is now a synthetic marijuana, K2 Spice. I'm sure there's other variations of it, but it is very, very dangerous and deadly, and you have to be very, very careful with that to make sure that you are, uh, a person is not taking in synthetic marijuana. THC is the major ingredient in marijuana, and that produces a mix of effects. It, like nicotine, is in the brain within about seven seconds. It relaxes you, disinhibits you. It may produce a euphoric high. Uh, it's a mild hallucinogen compared to what LSD is. And do understand that not everybody is going to respond to a uh, marijuana uh, by the way it would be maybe in a Cheech and Chong movie. Uh, some people can actually have very aggressive effects. You can get addicted to marijuana. Yes, it's true. Some people just uh, build up a tolerance for it, um, and it can be uh, it can give them heart palpitations, and it can have a a, a bad effect on them. Um, THC lingers in your body for approximately a month or more. Uh, it certainly can help with pain, and so it is prescribed in, it is, of course, legal in some states, not in others, more so for uh, prescription only, uh, and, um, and that's about it. So, this is going to be the final end of this episode three, and I would like you to uh, make sure that you read everything, that you're stopping and pausing your video so you can read all of the uh, additions that I've added to my the vocal lecture and take your 20-question quiz and you will be all set. And I will see you for episode 